as David said, we started um, um, our company, Patrick, my brother and I, in 1997. And one of the fundamental premises of our work has always been that there's a, there's a thinking and imagining that happens with one's hands that's just as important as what happens with one's head. Um, and by that, how that translated for us was that we, we found it necessary to build our own work. Um, uh, and if you, uh, the next thing that we found really necessary was that um, if you own your work, the work that you design and you build, you actually become fully responsible for your work. Um, it, it's act and if you don't do that, then you actually have the opportunity to lose that sense of ownership for your work. Somebody else takes it over. Um, so it, it's really why we became uh, developers, designers, and builders. Uh, I used to have a problem with the word developer, um, but I love it now, because if you really just think about the word, it's a great word. It's about developing. Um, and that's what we do at, at many levels. Um, a second premise of our work is that uh, we feel we have all, at our core, it, we have all, our work has always been an, about sustainability. But the distinction we want to make tonight is that it wasn't ever in, a, in the, quote, green sense, in the green washing sense that is kind of taking the, the architectural world by a storm, um, but rather in the sense uh, as it relates to, for instance, common sense. Um, inspiring ourselves and others to think otherwise. Um, working with the resources and materials we have at hand. Uh, thinking creatively and efficiently at every single scale. I can't stress how important that has been for us. Allowing a budget to inform our, our ideas rather than confine them. Uh, believing that thoughtful architecture doesn't mean expensive architecture. Uh, and most importantly, focusing all of our attention on the urban environment, because uh, that for us is a naturally efficient and sustainable uh, way of occupying the earth. The greener side of things, uh, the greener side of, the, uh, of sustainability for us, was an, ev an inevitable extension of our everyday way of operating. And I, I make that point because we keep getting a lot of interest in our work um, and uh, lectures and panel discussions and, and uh, articles about us being green architects and green builders. And um, so while that's important to us, uh, what, we'd, what we'd really like to um, uh, convey here tonight is that, uh, that we're in a transition right now. And the transition um, will hopefully come out of this lecture, but one of the fallouts in this transition of being the small firm that we were to this much larger firm um, has been this uh, idea that uh, as green architects and builders, people call us and they ask us about things like uh, they want to hear from us around how green roofs work, how low flow faucets work, how uh, energy, how you, how you um, um, manage energy in a building, how uh, what the difference between radiant heat and, and uh, forced air heating is. Um, uh, lots and lots of techniques, storm water techniques, all of these things which are actually extremely important to our work. Uh, but no longer are people calling us and in, interested in discussing things like they used to, like uh, how light illuminates a particular space uh, in, a, in a residential space, how the proportion of a window um, works with a facade and an overall streetscape or how a particular color engages a space or even how a plan or a section or a program actually contributes to a sense of place. Um, so it, it, it's, it, you know, all of that stuff, which is what architecture is about, uh, we just don't want to lose. Um, so I guess, and it's all very important and we, we're going to talk about all of that, but what we, I guess we'd like to do as an introduction here, very quickly, is to say that um, we'd much rather be really good architects than green architects. And uh, that encompasses so much more. And I, hopefully that's what uh, our work is seen as and that's what our work is about. And you'll see on this project the kind of, this is, this is our most exciting, most frightening uh, leap, of faith. leap of faith we've kind of ever taken. Uh, stable flats. There's a, an existing stables in the heart of uh, 
Northern Liberties right now. This is where this piece of this this kind of uh, open space here is actually really important. You'll see why, but it's literally where the horses roam. It's where the horses and carriages are for for Old City. Um, and uh, we we it's a series of low slung buildings that are essentially it's really just one wide open space surrounded by three um, three streets. And and we took it as that. And one of the things we said was let's work with what people typically would work with on a site like this. Many developers came to the neighborhood, presented a project that looked something like this, and got denied. And what this is, is a series of row houses with parking that comes through, and garages are here, and these are these decks that step back from it. And in our mind, it's a dead space. It's a dead development, and it's an individualized development with no sense of community. And yet, Let's work with it. So the first thing we did was, uh, because it makes sense at, at, at many levels, because this is Philly. Uh, so the first thing we did was, let's bring back the horses. Not literally, but the this is space. where the space, because it's a commodity, really, for the, for the neighborhood. It's a public space that you know, kid, people bring their kids and watch the horses <coughs> roam. So we wanted to bring that amenity back to the neighborhood. And then let's start with the module of the row home, but let's flip it on its head. And let's begin to reach towards each other here and try to make a connection and maybe get away from this individualized sense of the row home. And then let's start to think about how we build this as this modular system and begin to explore how that might begin to create exterior interior spaces. And let's put the parking, let's consolidate the parking um, uh, uh, in order to, to maximize the open community space. Uh, and let's begin to link these spaces together and then modulate that uh, down the site. And um, even, even the way in which the circulation happens which is through these lobbies, that these interior lobbies that then come out onto these exterior, what we call floating courtyards. They're all exterior, they're, they're, they're the main circulation, they're green spaces, decks, so forth, which you'll see in a second. Um, and then let's link the whole thing together as this kind of, as this community building rather than individual building. And at the same time, Collecting the rainwater. So what this is this project is actually centered in one of the major flood zones in Philadelphia, right off of the river, and they have constant problems. The water department, the watersheds department, have constant problems with flooding in homes there. So what we did was we said we originally they told us that we needed 200,000 gallons to hold as retention after we designed the green roof for the place. They told us that we needed nothing. However, we had already designed this. So what we did, instead of taking the 200,000 gallons away, we doubled it and said to the water department, why don't we collect all of the rainwater? Why don't you turn all your storm drains into our property? And the inlets. What, what, in we the did, what we decided to do was create a geothermal system that would incorporate the holding water as a heat sink, and we eliminated over 50% of the wells that we were going to install for this geothermal system by doing that while having the water department fund this project to eliminate a problem that they had. Yeah, so the tank, this big blue tank, uh, uh, the water department, we went to them and we said, what about a big tank here? Would that make a difference in the flooding of the, the, of the neighborhood? And they said, that's kind of wacky, but we'll look at it. Um, and they came back to us and they said it'll actually stop a 25-year flood. And so we said, great, will you pay for it? <laughs> and they said, sure. They haven't quite come up with the money yet, but because we didn't need the tank. We, we wanted to create this um, synergy with, with uh, different people in the community, and this was one of them. Um, so the tank is now funded uh, and sitting there 55 degree water, why not run our heating and cooling lines through it? And, and because we doubled it, we now have uh, sufficient means to flush toilets with it and use all of the, the water, half of the water that we're holding for outdoor uses for gardens. Um, and then the, the, the modules themselves become really fun, become really fun to play with. 
Um, th these are the things that get built in the factory uh, that we, again, we're partners in this factory. We weren't just, we, we, we couldn't just take our tool belts off and give over the building of the project to somebody else. So our way of dealing with it was to go to this company and say, would you be interested in creating this whole other division to your company where we're 50-50 partners in it so that we have a say in how this thing goes? And I can't believe they took us <laughs> up on it, but, um, but they did, and it's, it's going to be very exciting. Um, these are, this, is, this shows how three modules come together. Uh, the center module houses, uh, there are two units actually, the center module houses all of the wet stuff, all of the mechanical stuff, absolutely everything, uh, leaving the other modules wide open, um, kind of really beautiful, uh, spacious uh, spaces in these fairly small 16 feet wide uh, modules. But um, at the same time, incredibly flexible uh, so that we could create a, a two-bedroom unit here, a two-bedroom unit here. And with changing out a door, um, closing that door and opening a door up here, turning this into a three-bedroom unit and a one-bedroom unit, <coughs> or vice versa, uh, a one-bedroom unit and a three-bedroom unit, um, all really being about uh, how we create a, um, a diverse community here. Uh, there's a 230 uh, kW solar voltaic uh, panel system on this roof, which is a story in itself. Uh, For another time. I need, no, I need to tell you this one, because it's, it's really exciting. Chris? It's okay. Do you mind? <laughs> Do you mind? This is, this is um, again, the, the, the thing I want to leave you, I think we want to leave you with here tonight is, uh, we are building this at the same cost per square foot that other non-sustainable, horrible buildings are being built for around the neighborhood. And we're doing it because we believe at every single level, you just simply need to be creative and rethink how things can be done. How can you put a $2 million solar panel system on a project and not have it reflect uh, itself in the budget in some way. You go to, a, you, you do research, and you find companies that have realized this already, and they've said, how about if we own the system, we install it for you, we get the tax credits, the federal, uh, the uh, energy credits, uh, there we are, the energy credits, um, and you buy power from us for the next 20 years, and we'll, and we'll maintain it for the next 20 years. Um, That's fixed rate at a fixed rate. Just as Pico's power is about to go unregulated and through the roof, these, this, this community's power will stay the same for the next 20 years. So, so what we've done effectively is create a replicable system in, uh, that, that we have just gotten a grant for, which has also helped this happen, from uh, the Department of Environmental Protection because they see this as a, a it, when, not if, when this gets built, they see this as a as a, as a direct way of promoting the massive use of solar within, within Pennsylvania. An entirely new market will get developed because of this way of thinking. And that's just one example of how this building, I think, is going to um, be a model for, uh, uh, for sustainable urban building. And just one more point. Uh, getting a project like this financed in this environment was incredibly challenging going to all of the banks and being turned down. So the idea of bringing affordable housing into this project, uh, 14 of the 70 units will be affordable housing. And that opened up the opportunity to work with the state, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, who actually, we, we didn't fit their model, but they actually took it on and are providing construction financing for the entire project. And they've never done that before. And they see, the reason why they've done it is because they say, well, geez, if you guys can do this, then this is the way we want to build affordable housing in Pennsylvania. So you better, you better get it right. <laughs> this is the lobby. This is kind of how those spaces were. Uh, this community garden on the south end. And these are the floating courtyards uh, in the center of the building that um, you get to communicate between floors of people. This is how the mechanical parking uh, floor works above, uh, below the, the uh, floating courtyards. And uh, with that, we 
all. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you.